Hey folks, welcome back. This is the final video in the three-part series on causality. In this video, I'll be talking about causal discovery, which aims at inferring causal structure from data. I'll start by introducing what causal discovery is, sketching some big ideas, and then finishing with a concrete example with code in Python. So with that, let's get into the video. In the previous video, I was talking about causal inference which aims at answering questions about cause and effect. We talked about a lot of great things. We talked about the do operator, which simulates interventions. We talked about confounding, which talked about estimating causal effects, and all these things were great. However, there was one key assumption that was necessary in order to do causal inference, which was a causal model. And obviously, a lot of times in the real world, we don't have a causal model in hand when we're starting our analysis. And it's not always clear which variables cause which. Causal discovery is one thing that might help with obtaining a causal model. And the goal of causal discovery is to find causal structure in data. So basically, given data, inferring the underlying causal model. So causal discovery is an example of a so-called inverse problem. And inverse problems can be understood in contrast to forward problems. For example, imagine you have an ice cube sitting on your kitchen counter. You know the shape of the ice cube, you know the volume, and if you were to let that ice cube sit there for a few hours, you could probably predict with some reasonable degree of accuracy what the resulting puddle of water would look like. The inverse problem is like the opposite of this. In other words, the inverse problem would be given a puddle of water on the kitchen counter predicting the shape of the ice cube that made that puddle. And clearly this is a hard problem because there are several different shapes of ice that could create the same puddle of water. Connecting this to causal discovery, the the shape of the ice cube is like our causal model and the puddle of water is like the statistics that we observe in our data. So following this analogy, there are several causal models that could potentially generate the same statistics we observe in a given data set. The approach to solving inverse problems is to make assumptions. Basically, we narrow down the possible number of solutions through assumptions. And although assumptions help, they often do not fully solve the problem. This is where we need to use some tricks to go a little further. Here I'll talk about three different tricks for causal discovery. The first trick is conditional independence testing. I start here with a definition of statistical independence, which is shown here. In other words, two variables, x and y, are said to be independent if their joint distribution is equal to the product of their individual distributions. From this, we can get a definition of conditional conditional independence, which is basically the same thing. However, now we look at distributions of each variable when conditioned on a particular variable, say z. We can use this idea of conditional independence testing to do causal discovery. And this is actually the main idea behind one of the first causal discovery algorithms called the PC algorithm, which is named after its authors, Clark Glymore and Peter Spiertz. I probably butchered that, so I apologize, but there's a reference to a review paper by them at the bottom here. So I'll just briefly go through the main idea of the PC algorithm. More details can be found in the blog linked in the description. The first step is to form a fully connected undirected graph. So we have a node for each variable in our data set and we connect undirected edges between each of these nodes. In step two, we do pairwise independence tests. So we do an independence test between every possible pair of variables and if two variables are independent, we delete the undirected edge between them. The third step are conditional independence tests. So basically, we do the same thing. However, we pick a variable to condition on. Then if two variables are found to be conditionally independent, we delete the edge between them, and we add that conditioned node to the separation set. And we continue these conditional independence tests until there are no more candidates for conditional independence testing. Then in step four, we orient collide so if we have three variables, say i, j, and k, we form a collider out of them, meaning we make directed edges pointing from i to k and j to k, given k is not in the separation set of i and j. Then in step five, we add more directed edges to the graph, 
following two constraints. Namely, we do not create any new V structures in our graph, nor do we create any directed cycles. And hopefully after all that, we output a directed acyclic graph, which represents the causal connections of our system. Again, more details in the blog and the two references at the bottom here have a great description of the PC algorithm. So trick two is a greedy search of the DAG space. So there are three key concepts here. First is a DAG, which should be familiar since they've been discussed in the previous two videos. Next is a DAG space, or in other words, the space of all possible DAGs. For example, consider the space of DAGs with two nodes and one edge, which is shown here. There are only two possibilities. X could point to Y or Y could point to X. Then finally, we have the notion of a greedy search, which is a widely used idea in optimization. In short, a greedy search is an optimization strategy that picks what's best in the short run as opposed to the long run. And this is usually done using a heuristic or rule of thumb. For example, suppose you're trying to get out of a forest. You may think, I'm trapped in a forest. Forests have trees. So to get out of the forest, I should go where there aren't any trees. In other words, every step you take should be in the direction with the least number of trees. So you repeat this strategy and go all the way along this black line until you finally get out of the forest, which we can call the greedy path because it is the result of a greedy search. However, if at the start you were to go in the exact opposite direction of the greedy path, you would make it back to civilization much faster. So you might say, why would we ever want to use a greedy search from the look of it? They just seem to give suboptimal solutions. Well, the problem is that a lot of the time computing the optimal solution is intractable, meaning if you ran an algorithm that tried out all possible solutions, all possible paths out of the forest and compared them to each other, you would be waiting a long time for it to run. And maybe your grandkids would see the solution in their lifetime. And this is the problem we face in causal discovery. We want to find the optimal DAG that best explains a given data set. The problem is if we tried an exhaustive search, we have to deal with the fact that the number of possible DAGs is a super exponential in the number of nodes in a graph. In other words, if we have just three variables, the number of possible DAGs is 25. If we have six nodes, we're already over 3 million possibilities. And if we have a measly 10 variables or 10 nodes in our graph, the possible DAGs is on the order of 10 to the power of 18. So even though greedy searches do not guarantee the optimal solution, at least they give us a solution in a reasonable amount of time. And so a causal discovery method that uses a greedy search is the so-called greedy equivalence search algorithm. So the basic idea of this algorithm is you start with a complete unconnected DAG and you iteratively add edges to this unconnected graph such that you maximize a score value. So in other words, you start with a set of nodes that correspond to each of your variables, but no edges between them. Then you add edges one by one according to some score. So the question is, what is the score that I'm talking about? Basically, this quantifies how good your DAG is or how well the DAG explains the data. So there are a few options to defining this score. One is the so-called Bayesian information criterion and source number one reference at the bottom here has a brief discussion for anyone that is interested. Then you can repeat this process until you reach some stopping criterion, which could be some number of edges have been added or the score stops increasing or whatever that may be. Okay, so the final trick is exploiting asymmetry. And so as I discussed in the first video, asymmetry is a fundamental property of this causality framework. So it's natural to think maybe we can leverage asymmetry to help us find good causal models from data. And there are three flavors of asymmetry that I've come across. And I'll say as a disclaimer that these aren't any kind of standard classification for these things. These are just some labels I'm putting on some themes that I have gleaned from looking at this stuff. So the first flavor is what I call time asymmetry, which is based on the idea that causes precede effects. This is what is used in Granger causality, which is a method to quantifying a asymmetric relationship between two variables based on prediction. And more information about Granger causality can be found in this first reference here. And there's a lot of stuff out there on Granger causality. You can just do a simple Google search and you'll probably find a bunch of stuff. The second asymmetry is what I call complexity asymmetry, which is basically the Occam's razor principle that simpler models are better. So going back to our ice cube example from earlier, following this principle, we would say the ice cube that's actually a cube is preferred over the more complicated ice because
because it is simpler. And finally, the third flavor is what I call functional asymmetry, where better functional fits are better candidates for a causal model. So one method that uses this is the nonlinear additive noise model. The way this works is suppose we start with two statistically dependent variables, x and y. We then model y in terms of a nonlinear function of x. Then we compute a noise term by taking the difference between y and this nonlinear functional fit. And then finally, we test whether the noise term n is independent of x. If it is, we accept the model and say x causes y. And if not, we reject it. And then we can do the same thing in the opposite direction where we model x in terms of a nonlinear function of y and repeat the same procedure. And more details on this method can be found in reference number three. And generally, all of these are great resources if you're trying to learn more about causal discovery. Okay, so wrapping up these tricks, we have a trick-based taxonomy. And it's important to note that these tricks are not mutually exclusive. In all cases, there are indeed algorithms that will mix and match different ones for causal discovery, as shown in the bottom row of the table here. And as a bit of commentary, causal discovery seems to me at least to be a relatively young field. So there still has not emerged a single or small set of causal discovery algorithms that beat out all others in all situations. And I'll also say that this is by no means an exhaustive list of causal discovery techniques. However, this is probably a good start for anyone trying to get into causal discovery. And the references given at the bottom here can get the ball rolling for you. Okay, so I will conclude with a concrete example like in the previous video. So we're gonna be using the same census data set as before, but instead of having just three variables of age, education, and wealth, we're gonna include more variables. And instead of using the Microsoft do Y library for causal inference, we're gonna be using the causal discovery toolbox. So again, first step is importing libraries, loading data. Then for a lot of these causal discovery algorithms, it helps to start with a so-called graph skeleton. So this is like step two that we saw with the PC algorithm, where we do the pairwise independence testing and we have bidirected edges or undirected edges between variables that are statistically dependent. And then you can visualize the network pretty easily using network X. So the first causal discovery algorithm that I use here in this example is the PC algorithm. So again, we just do that in two lines and it spits out this causal graph. The graph is somewhat reasonable. It's not perfect, but we can see that we have has graduate degree, which is like our education variable, causes a variable greater than 50K, which is our income variable. And then we also have age causing our income variable, which is what we expected. But what was not expected expected is our education variable has graduate degree is pointing toward age. So this is saying whether or not someone has a graduate degree has a causal impact on their age, which is not true. If you give someone a graduate degree, it's not going to have any effect on their age. Another interesting thing is we have several variables having a causal effect on the number of hours that someone works in a week. So whether or not they have a graduate degree has a causal effect on the number of hours they work, their age has an effect, and whether or not they're female. So this is basically their two options, male or female, in this data set. And then the ethnicity information captured by is white is uh, bidirectional, so the PC algorithm wasn't able to to break that symmetry. But what's interesting is uh, hours per week causes a single variable, which is in relationship. So what this is saying is the number of hours you work per week has a causal effect on whether you're in a relationship or not. So we could look at this all day and kind of craft whatever stories we want in our minds, but this should definitely be taken with a grain of salt. So the next algorithm that we try out is the greedy equivalent search algorithm, which uses trick number two, greedy search of the DAG space. And this gives us a causal graph that is some Somewhat similar to what the PC algorithm gave us. Notably that edge between hours per week and is white, the symmetry was broken, so it's not a bi-directed edge. And then finally, we use the LinGam algorithm. And this one doesn't really give us something sensible. It's basically everything is causing has graduate degree. So whether you make more than $50,000 impacts your graduate degree. How many hours per week you work has an impact on your graduate degree. And these edges seem backwards. This algorithm doesn't seem to do great job and that's because it's assuming linear relationships between variables and since most of these variables are boolean that's not something that necessarily makes sense code can be found at the github linked at the bottom here put the link in the description feel free to take this data run with it feel free to leave a comment i'd be interested to hear the results of
of your analysis. So that concludes our series on causality. We started in the first video introducing this new science of cause and effect. The second video we talked about causal inference. And finally in this video we concluded with causal discovery. If you enjoyed the series, please consider liking, subscribing, sharing, commenting your thoughts. If you're interested in learning more, check out the blog. Check out the GitHub to get your hands on the example code discussed in this video. As always, thanks for watching.